we all turn in our Bibles tonight to Exodus chapter 32, Exodus chapter number 32. Would anybody here had wanted Moses' job? I wouldn't have. <clears throat> Moses was called to a tough task. And as much as we lift up these Bible characters, they are tremendous individuals of faith, both men and women of faith in the Bible. We're talking this morning about Deborah, a great woman of faith. When there were no judges to be found, Deborah stepped in. And then in the New Testament, those women Mary and, and Martha, and, and uh, they were very courageous women, more so than the men were, especially during the crucifixion. And uh, then who can forget Esther? She saved a nation, right? Uh, there are tremendous people of faith in the Bible, both men and women. And Moses is one of those men of great faith and was called to do a tough task. I think if Moses had known all the ins and outs of what God was going to have him do, I think Moses might have said, ah, I think I'll pass because it was very difficult. He was called to lead the people out of Israel, but I do know this, God's hand was among, upon Moses, wasn't it? And uh, look, when God's hand is upon you, you can do anything he calls you to do. Now, this idea of we're not equipped or we're not able is not part of the Christian vocabulary. God is able uh, to equip us, and he does equip us for any task that he will put us toward or put toward us. Um, the grace of God will never fail us if we are in the will of God. So the hand of God was upon Moses from the time that he was a baby. And here was Israel praying for a deliverer. They prayed for a deliverer for 400 years. Somebody get us out of here. And God gives them Moses, and they complain about Moses. I mean, he had it tough. He was raised in a good home by the power and the promise of God raised in the home. Amram and Jochebed were his mother and father. And uh, when Moses was born, the edict was that all the men child should be killed. You all remember the story. Kill the babies, kill the boys. And by the way, God forgive our nation for killing baby boys. The Pharaoh said, kill all the baby boys. Just throw them in the Nile. Just drown them. And Moses was hid by his mother. She hid him as long as she could. The Bible says when she could no longer hide her son, she had to let him go by faith. And I can't imagine being a parent and letting my child go in the way she had to let her child go. Made that ark of bulrushes, you all know the story. Made that ark and how a mother must have so carefully, and, and I'm sure the father involved, so carefully making this ark. Making this little basket, this little boat that they could put their boy in. And send him down the river and pray that God will watch over him and take care of him. I know there's some parents here that in some ways you've had to sort of ask God to take care of your children. They're far away. They've moved away. They've gone a different path. Some have gone in such a direction that they almost don't resemble the way you raised them. And your hands are off, right? There had to come a time when Amram and Jochebed took their hands off the little basket. And I think it's a good prayer to pray for God to take care and for God to just put his hands upon our children. You take care of him or her and bless them. <clears throat> Moses was let go in that river and by the providence of God, ordained by God, he began to cry as he went down that river at the same mo moment when Pharaoh's, uh, when Pharaoh's daughter was down at the river. And then her heart was, was pulled toward that baby. And she took Moses out of the river. In fact, his name means out of the water. She took the little baby out of the water, and, 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 and God knit her heart to that baby's heart. And, and uh, then by the miraculous work of God, this is, I know I've said this to our church family, by the miracle of God, Pharaoh's daughter said, I need somebody to raise this little baby. I'll take the baby when he's a little older, but I need someone to raise him up till he's weaned and till I can take him into my house. And there was Moses' older sister. And she piped up and said, well, I know someone who could likely do a very good job at raising that boy. And went back and got Moses' mother. Uh, and Moses' mother came to Pharaoh's daughter and said, I'll be glad to raise that child. And then Moses, Pharaoh's daughter said this, I will gladly pay thee thy wages. 
remember preaching years ago on getting paid to raise your own kids. She got paid by Pharaoh to raise her own son. Isn't God good? God is good. Moses was raised there with his mother and father for a time until he was, at what particular age, we're not sure, but then he was raised for the rest of his childhood and early adulthood in Pharaoh's own palace. He was raised to be the deliverer. He spent 40 years of his life. You can divide Moses' life sort of in, 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 in two stages at the beginning. There was 40 years until he was uh, born, until he was 40 years old. That was the time that, that Moses became something. He became the, the prince of Egypt. Tremendous education. Was taught in all the cultural things and was taught in military war and, and, and the best of the best Moses received. So for 40 years he became something. And guess what happened the next 40 years? God had to make him nothing. Because here's the thing, God doesn't use somebody that thinks they're somebody. God still uses the humble, and he rejects the proud. Rejects the proud. So Moses fled from Egypt after murdering the Egyptian. He spent 40 years in the desert with his uh, father-in-law Jethro, and he just became a simple shepherd. Here is the mighty Moses trained in so many uh, different ways in Egypt, but just shepherding sheep on the backside of the desert. And God had to make him a nobody. So much so that when God appeared to him in that burning bush, uh, and God said, Moses, I'm going to send you to get my people out of there. Moses said, it can't be me, Lord. It can't be me. Not me. But he was the man. And after God had instilled in him this faith that he was the one to be the deliverer, he went back to his people and by a mighty hand, I don't have to go over the whole story, but by a mighty hand, God brought him out. With those plagues, remember the plagues? I mean, God ex exhibited his tremendous power upon Egypt and the mightiest nation on the face of the earth folded and crumbled. As much as Pharaoh said, I will not, I will not, I will not, I will not, we all know that you, you cannot fight God. When the mighty Pharaoh and the mighty Egypt folded and crumbled, the entire nation is in ruins and Moses gets to lead the people out, not by might, not by war, not by sword, not by strength, not by a conflict. But the Bible says that the Egyptians actually said, you guys got to go. And so they went. They went that very night with the smell of the furnaces. Up. Remember, they were slaves. They went that very night of the Passover, and God said, you be ready all night because we're going. By the beautiful picture of the rapture. We should always be ready because we're going. Right, church? Mm -hmm. So Moses said, you be ready because we're going. And with the smell of the smoke of the, of the brick furnaces, of the brick they made that day, still on their clothes, they march out of Egypt. Free people. Free. God brought them out. But as hard as it was, in, in some ways, for God to get Israel out of Egypt, hard the way we look at it, as much of a task as that was getting Israel out of Egypt, I think the harder of the two tasks was getting Egypt out of Israel. And I've learned this in my Christian life. Sometimes the hardest thing I have in life is God getting the world out of me. I'm glad he saved me. But there's a lot of effort that the Lord Jesus Christ puts into me, not to get me out of Egypt per se, but to get Egypt out of me, to get the world out of me. And here we are in Exodus chapter number 32. Uh, the children of Israel have been delivered. They've wandered for some time. And if you're familiar with the way uh, these passages uh, are here, that this is the time that God is, is uh, meeting with his people. Uh, in chapter number 32, the Bible says in verse number 1 of Exodus, And when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down out of the mount." The people gathered themselves together unto Aaron and said unto him, Up, make us gods which shall go before us. For as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we want not what has become of him. If you are familiar with Moses going up to the mountain, and God gives him those tablets of stone that has the commandments written on it. Right, church? There's those commandments. We've seen the pictures. Children in Sunday school know about the tablets of stone and the commandments. God gave those directly to Moses. Beautiful. 
And Moses is up on the mountain, the remainder of the nation of Israel that knows now a lot about God. They've seen him work in great ways. They're at the bottom of the mountain. Aaron is there with them at the bottom of the mountain. Moses is at the top of the mountain. And here they say, well, this Moses, he might never come back. Who knows? All we see is smoke, thunder, weird stuff up there on the mountain. So who knows if Moses is ever going to come back. So we got an idea. We are going to make ourselves some gods. Uh, the title of my message, I, I had some fun with the title, is, is uh, Water and Gold Dust Don't Taste Good. Water and Gold Dust Don't Taste Good. And here's the whole purpose. I, I normally don't do this, but I'm going to throw out the entire purpose of the message at the beginning, and then prayerfully at the end of it in just a few minutes we'll be able to see it clearly from this text. The whole purpose of the message is this. God is a forgiving God. I am glad that God is forgiving. I am thankful that God is kind. I am thankful that God is merciful. I am thankful that God forgives when forgiveness is not warranted. And if we're not careful, we will sometimes think that we deserve forgiveness. Dear brother and sister with me in Christ, no person has ever deserved forgiveness from God. Not one. Not one. And when I see these Israelites, the nation of Israel, as they have followed Moses out, Moses is up on the mountain getting the commandments. The people are down at the bottom. And when I read what they did in chapter 32, I'm sort of thinking, Lord, they have no reason to be forgiven for what they did. So here was their plan. Verse 2, Aaron said unto them, Break off the golden earrings, which are in the ears of your wives, of your sons, and of your daughters, and bring them unto me. And all the people break off the golden earrings, which were in their ears, and brought them unto Aaron. And he received them at their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool after he had made it a molten calf. And they said, these be thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. I believe the people are angry that Moses isn't leading them. After all, they've sort of stalled. They're just sitting around at a mountain. They're just stationary. We're supposed to be moving. We've got to be going. And Moses is up there on the mountain. Who knows if he'll ever come back or when he'll come back. So let's take things into our own hands. When I read this passage, I, in the past, have given Aaron sort of a tough, tough way to go. Aaron was Moses' brother, and Aaron knew God. Remember, it was Aaron's rod through which God showed his power. And why would Aaron, now think with me, church, because many of you, this is our Sunday night crowd. Why would Aaron say, let's make a golden calf? This doesn't make much sense. Well, he got it from the earrings and their necklaces that they all brought in. Huh? What's that? Yeah, they, they, they had earrings down the whole way, Anna, down both of them. <laughs> the big ones, dangly ones. <laughs> uh, they had a lot of gold. You remember where they got the gold, Anna? From the Egyptians who said, take it, just take it, just take it all out of you. So here is Aaron, who I don't think, I believe Aaron's sort of trying to stall here. I think the people of Israel are getting sort of like a mob mentality. This is the way I picture it. Here's the nation of Israel like, hey, we, we don't like this. This ain't going good. We should be doing something. What's going on? Somebody should go check. This ain't right. We should be moving. And Aaron's trying to just sort of quiet the mob kind of mentality. And he thinks, well, the first thing I'll do is I'll have him give some money. That will really quiet them up. <laughs> and lo and behold, the people just start taking their gold. And saying, here, you can have it. we got to do something. we got to move. We've got to make some progress. Take our gold. Take whatever we have. And then the Bible says in this text, if you'll notice, when they break off the golden earrings in verse number 3, verse number 4 says, He received them at their hand and fashioned this graving tool, this molten calf. Now look at verse number 5. And, uh, and when Aaron saw it, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made a provocation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to the Lord. Maybe he's even still trying to stall. Surely Moses will come back. I mean, it's, he's got to come down off the mountain at some point. So everybody, tomorrow we'll make this feast. Let's just take the night 
take a little time. We'll be patient. Maybe Aaron is trying to stall the people. I don't know. I don't want to beat up on Aaron too much. But then to his surprise, when do the people show up in verse number 6? Early. How early? We don't know. 4 a.m., here's the crowd. Let's do this, Aaron. What are we waiting for? You said tomorrow. This is tomorrow. This is the day. Let's put this together. You know, these Israelites were not rational. Are you glad that God forgives when you do things that aren't too rational? I've learned this in my Christian life. Most of the time when I sin, I do not sin because it is something I didn't know I shouldn't do. It is something I did irrationally. It is something that I walked into knowing better. My mother was right. You know better, she would tell me. You know better, and it's true. I know better. The sins that I commit are sins that I know better than to commit. And we look at these Israelites and say, didn't they know better? I believe they did. They had just seen God do such miraculous things. They had heard the testimony of God from Moses. And I know that they knew better, but they were irrational. When they began to worship, look at this kind of worship in verse number 6. They rose up early on the morrow and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings. And the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. I've quoted those scriptures before, eat and drink and rose up to play. But when you create your own God, you can also create your own rules. And many today create their own God, and therefore they feel they have the right to create their own rules. And that's exactly what they did. They were worshiping. Maybe some of them felt as though they were worshiping Jehovah. In fact, the word Lord, capital L-O-R-D, is here in this text at the end of verse number 5. There shall be a feast to who? The Lord. That's Jehovah. So here's Aaron saying, let's worship this idol. Let's offer some sacrifice. Let's put the golden calf here, and we will worship Jehovah God. But they wanted to worship the right God in the wrong way. That is just as much idolatry as worshiping the wrong God. It is equal idolatry to worship the right God the wrong way than it is to worship the wrong God. See, They were idolatrous in this worship. Uh, in verse number 25, look what the party was like. Look at verse number 25 of the same chapter. Verse 25, if this don't give you a picture of what it means to eat and drink and rise up to play, I don't know what will. And when Moses saw that the people were naked, for Aaron had made them naked unto their shame among their enemies. That's talking about the party. The feast. The happy time. I looked at a couple of commentaries. I try to, it may not seem like it, but I try to do research before the messages. And uh, this, the, at least the commentaries I read said this was almost an immoral kind of party. Now, here, here, remember our subject tonight. God is a great forgiver. And when I look at what these people did, who had just been brought through so much by the grace of God, so much by the power of God, they were idolatrous, they made false pagan gods, they were offering sacrifices to false gods, they had this immoral kind of party where they were obviously naked. <clears throat> Why is this such a big deal? Why is this such a big deal about them making a, a, a golden calf? You remember when God said to let my people go, he told Pharaoh to let them go that they may worship me. Now you can read it in chapter number 8, chapter number 7, chapter number 9. Through all of those plagues, Moses told Pharaoh, God said, let my people go that they may worship me. And here they are worshiping, but worshiping so, so poorly. Could you imagine the feelings? And we know that God has feelings. The Bible says that God can become angry. He becomes jealous. We know he feels love. He has compassion. Can you imagine God's feelings to see this nation he just delivered and this golden calf and the offerings and the smoke going up and hearing them say, these be our gods which brought us out of Egypt. Can't hardly imagine. Can't hardly imagine. It was a misplaced kind of worship. 
a worship that involved sacrifice, and they gave the animals and all the provision that God had given them when they came out of Egypt. They are burning it to a false uh, pagan-like golden calf and giving themselves to this kind of sacrifice. So here's what sort of prompted my message. Would you look, please, at verse number 32? Verse number 32. There's something here in the Bible that I've never seen before. And I know many of you have studied the Bible longer and deeper than I have. And maybe after the service you can help me. But look at verse number 32. Yet now, if thou wilt forgive their sins. And what comes after that? You see the, How many see the dash? How many have a dash like that? It's not even like a normal dash. Does yours look like a long dash? Now, I, I'm confessing my, my own unsurety on this, but I've never seen a dash like that in the Bible. And I checked several other Bibles that I had, had that dash. Has anyone else ever seen that anyplace else in the Bible? A long dash like that. Okay, so I'm not alone. It may be in there somewhere, but I tried looking up in the Strong's and I couldn't find a dash in <laughs> the Strong's concordance. So I'm not really sure how to find, even do a search for a long dash. Uh, some of you can try it on your, on your, on your phone uh, Bible. You'll search for the dash and find some dashes. What does that dash mean? I wonder if when Moses is praying, God, if you will forgive their sin. And then the dash means he stops because he's sort of speechless. It's almost like he's just saying, God, would you please forgive them? And he stops because... They're not even worth forgiving. After all they have done, after this display of nakedness and immorality, after this, you know, you just gave me these commandments, thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Oh, here's something else that I, 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 I got a kick out of. In verse number 7 of chapter number 32, look at this, verse number 7. You'll like this, and I'm going to bring this to a close real quick. That Moses is up on the mountain. In verse 7, And the Lord said unto Moses, Go get thee down for thy people, which thou broughtest out of the land of Egypt, have corrupted themselves. Does anybody else see some humor in that? Because every other time God calls them my people, I delivered them, I brought them out by a mighty hand. But I just have to see the humor that God is up there on the mountain. He knows what's happening down there at the bottom. He says, Moses, look at your people down there. Look at what they're doing down there, the people you brought out of Egypt. I wonder if Moses felt a little guilty even asking for forgiveness. Can I ask our church tonight, have you ever been to a place where you felt sort of guilty asking God to forgive you? I know I've been there. I know there's been times in my life when I've done the same thing over and over and over and over again, and I've asked God to forgive, and I know he forgives. We all know that tonight. But I'm just trying to remind us how good his forgiveness is and how deep his forgiveness is. That the sin was so great, Moses couldn't even complete the prayer. In fact, when Moses came down from the mountain, he was upset, he was angry, and it was justified anger. So when Moses came down from the mountain, what did he do with the tablets? He threw the tablets down and they broke. But that's not all he did with the tablets. And, oh, oh, by the way, what did he do with the golden calf? He ground it to powder. Now, this is interesting here. He ground it to powder in verse number, where is it at here? Verse number 20. He took the calf which they had made and burned it in the fire and ground it to powder and strawed it upon the water and made the children of Israel drink of it. Yikes. Water with ground up, burnt up dust in it. The people drank this water. Their sin was so great. And what is God going to do? Well, look at verse number 11, and I'll close right here with verse number 11. And I'll just read. We won't turn anyplace else. And Moses besought the Lord his God and said, Lord, why doth thy wrath wax hot against thy people? And why hast thou, which hast thou hast brought forth out of the land of Egypt with great power, with a mighty hand, Wherefore should the Egyptians speak and say, for mischief did he bring them out, to slay them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? 
turn from thy fierce wrath and repent of this evil against thy people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, thy servants, to whom thou swearest by thine own self, and sayest unto them, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven, and all this land which I have spoken of, of will I give unto your seed, and they shall inherit it forever. Now here's verse 14. And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. Anybody else thankful for God's forgiveness? Thankful for God's mercy? Thankful for God's long-suffering? Thankful that God gives second chances? Micah said it this way, Who is a God like unto thee, that pardoneth iniquity, that passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He retaineth not his anger forever, praise God. Because he delighteth in mercy, he will turn again, he will have compassion on us, he will subdue our iniquities, and thou wilt cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. And one more scripture that I'll read, and please just listen as I read this. Verse Isaiah 43, 22 to 26, just listen carefully and I'll close. But thou hast not called upon me, O Jacob. Thou hast been weary of me, O Israel. Thou hast not brought me the small cattle of the burnt offerings, neither hast thou honored me with thy sacrifices. I have not caused thee to serve with an offering, nor wearied thee with incense. Thou hast brought me no sweet cane with money, neither hast thou filled me with the fat of thy sacrifices, but thou hast made me to serve with thy sins. Thou hast wearied me. Listen to what God said. Thou hast wearied me with thine iniquities. God says, I'm so tired of the sin. And he says, I, even I, am he that blotteth out thy transgressions. Now here's the key words I want you to remember. For my name's The only reason why we can have any ounce of forgiveness, salvation, forgiveness, or forgiveness in the Christian life is because of God's own person. You know what the nation of Israel deserved after this episode of nakedness and this kind of worship? You know what they deserved? They deserved exactly what God wanted to do. God said, I'm going to blot them all out. I'm going to destroy them all. And Moses, I'll start a new nation with you. Moses said, God, you can't do that. Don't do that. Forgive these people. Let them go into the land. Give them another chance. And God did. So the whole purpose that God put on my heart tonight is for you and I, especially if we're saved. Here's a Sunday night crowd. Most of us are born again. Thank God that he's a forgiving God. As wretched and as poor as we are. I praise his name for his forgiveness. Thank him for it. Can we bow for a prayer?